Good morning, everyone. Before we get started, let's uh, just start off with a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I don't know why you brought each of us here. We're all coming from different places with different thoughts and different habits and different family situations and circumstances, but you wanted us here for a reason. So Lord God, I ask that for each person that's here today and watching this later, that you would make this a special moment where you reveal something about yourself, something we need to know to help us be more like you, to help us on our journey. Heavenly Father, we ask a special blessing on this time and the information that's presented and as we cover the information from the Apostle John, be with us and just give me the words that you would give if you were here. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you know, we're starting with the book of first john it's something that we started just a couple weeks ago and we're going through uh, verse by verse chapter by chapter but each section of the book seems to have a different theme so if you get some of our announcements you'll see that sometimes we promote what's coming up in terms of the theme but we are taking it methodically uh, today we're looking at a pretty serious issue and that is false prophets in the church and how that's addressed but before we jump into the details I'd like to just throw out a random thought. I like to do this every once in a while uh, before we start our conversation. And that is the depth that you are able to grow in your faith walk is determined by how you plug in. Your personal growth is ultimately determined by how deeply you plug into the, the church and your spiritual commitments. So for example, if you are coming to a main church service, and that's all you do, you just come for the service, you listen, you worship, you sing, and then you leave, you're not getting intense understanding and scriptural learning. You just can't. I mean, the service is only 25 minutes, the, the teaching time. That's not enough time for the pastor to get into any serious discussion. But if you're involved in some type of a Bible study group or a small group or a life group like this, you're actually getting much more into the depths of God's Word. You're learning things that you're not going to hear elsewhere. And this is where we really grow in our faith. But there's something even deeper than that. And that is when you start to plug into a, a small group, um, sometimes we call them home groups, home churches, shepherd groups, flock groups, community groups, whatever you call them. Those are small, more intimate groups of people, five, six, uh, usually small groups that are building community together. That's where you establish accountability and friendships. If you're sick and in bed, those are probably the folks that are gonna be the most responsive to come and help you. So I'm just gonna challenge you, if you are you know, plugging in online or just coming to a worship service and that's it, go deeper. Figure out what you need to do in your schedule to be able to plug into things like this so that you can get more depth of understanding and knowledge of God's Word. So let's start off right now with a recap of where we were at from last week because John is the author. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. He was, as you remember, an apostle of Jesus, a disciple. He was with him at all the major events in Jesus' life. He was the firsthand eyewitness to his, his resurrection, uh, his glorified body. He was there at Jesus' death. He saw the transfiguration. So John is this authoritative writer because he was there. He saw things happen. In this set of letters, especially right now, 1 John, there's a specific purpose uh, for John's writing. And he actually makes it very obvious in chapter 2, verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So very specifically, this letter written to the churches of the time is addressing the fact that there are people now coming into the church and they're deceptive. They're intentionally trying to deceive and they have a false gospel, a false doctrine. And just as a matter of recap, this is not written to a specific church. This is written to all of the churches in Asia Minor. So as you know, Paul and his missionary journeys and the other folks that were involved in church planting, they established these churches uh, all the way to Rome. But 
as the churches began to grow in number, John served as an elder in his older years. And so he's writing this this epistle to the wider body of believers. And what's great about that is we can take his teaching today and say it's for us because we're part of that wider body of believers. We're part of the church that has just continued to expand globally. Now, last week, we specifically talked about his message related to what it means to be walking in the light. And that when you're walking in the light, you're living differently. One of the key points was those who walk in the light will love others the way God loves us. Okay, so we talked about that uh, agape love. And then those who know God will overcome the evil one. So we, positionally, we have a, a place where we stand and we can stand in front of evil and confront evil knowing that we have victory through Jesus. So that's really clear. And then the third point was those who love the Father will not love the things of the world. And we concluded with that with kind of an intense deep dive into what it means to be tempted with the things of the world versus loving the things of the Father and how we're faced with these choices all the time. So John's going to go on, and now he's going to address some more issues, again, for this New Testament church. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 2 and 3, uh, we're going to go through several things. First of all, the main point is Christ is the only way to the Father. He's going to make this really clear, that there's not multiple paths to heaven. And so when we're talking with folks that you know, believe in all alternate gospels or multiple paths or multiple religions, we know that that is not of the Bible. And John's going to make that really clear. Uh, one of the key points he's going to make is antichrists are at work within the church, and they're opposing the work of Jesus. And we're going to dig deeply into what that means. We're also going to cover the fact that Christ is the only one who gives eternal life. So if you remember, I had mentioned in a prior week that when you look at the writing of, say, Paul to the Roman church, the book of Romans, he has a very methodical style of making an argument, almost like a, a, a court case that is being made with facts. You look at his testimony to Felix, for example, uh, he, he's methodically laying out his position in Christ and how he came to the knowledge of Jesus. John doesn't write that way. It doesn't have this mechanical, methodical, structured style. What he's doing is he's just sharing his thoughts. And what he does is he, he presents an idea and then he goes deeper with that idea. And then he presents the same idea again and goes deeper. And again, it goes deeper. And so sometimes we're reading and we think, oh, didn't he call, already cover that? Well, yes, but now he's gonna bring up another point and he's gonna get more deep into the subject. So. We're going to talk about how Christ is the only way to eternal life, but he's going to go more deeply into what that means. And then finally, we can stand before the throne of God with confidence. And this is something that we enjoy positionally because we're justified, and we're going to talk about that. So the first thing is that antichrists are at work already here within the church. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 23, we start off with children. It is the last hour, and just as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. This is how we know it is the last hour. So this reference to the last hour is only here. It doesn't exist elsewhere. This is very unique, but he's talking about something in particular, and that is that we're in the last phase of time before Christ returns and redeems his church. So let, let, let me do a sidebar here and give you the, the big word of the day. You, you know, if you've been here, you, you know, we've talked about justification and sanctification and glorification. Well, today our big word of the day is uh, dispensationalism. So I'm going to try to um, make this three hour explanation into more like three minutes or less. So let, let me do it this way. If, if, for example, we looked at police investigative work, when you 
and, and I, I can share this kind of detail because in my prior, 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 prior life, I was a police officer in Southern California. And when we were taught what forensics was to support detective investigations, one of the things that was so fascinating is a forensic examiner can take all this data from all these different places. They can go to your trash, they can go to your email account, they can go to your, your letters, they can go to all these different sources and start pulling together information. And so what they do is they, they put together a, a, a timeline and whenever they get something, they can take that piece of evidence and they can drop it on the timeline and create a sequence of events. For example, uh, they, they pull out a, a receipt from Kroger and you've gone and you've purchased some medicine, has a date stamp on it. So we know that the, it occurred on a certain day. And then there's a text message that says, oh, I'm not feeling well. I might not be able to go to church this coming Sunday. Well, that must have occurred before you bought the medicine. So now we know, if we, even if we don't have a timestamp, there's a sequence of events. And then if there's a, another piece of information that says, hey, I'm looking forward to seeing you at church on Sunday, then that would have preceded all these things because there was no indication that the person was getting sick. And so every time they pull out some piece of information or evidence, they could drop it onto the timeline somewhere and it shows a complete picture and that way, when somebody comes up with a testimony in court and says, well, no, this is actually what happened, they could say, well, that makes sense because it's consistent with the timeline, or it's not. It doesn't make sense. That can't be true. The same thing happens when Bible commentators and Bible researchers are looking at Scripture. We're looking at this timeline from eternity past to eternity future, and we're, we're looking at how God works with his people at different phases of time and things that are revealed, things that happen. And what we see is that there's, there's all kinds of things that are occurring at different times. And so the, the researchers call this dispensations, where at different points in time uh, on this timeline, we've got different periods in which God's working differently with his people. And so the the, the dispensation of the law, for example, was that time when God has given the law to the Jews and it was there to show that they cannot live up to a holy standard. But then we live today in the age of grace where we're able to then trust in the Lord and his death and resurrection on the cross. And so we have a whole different period of time that we're in that's different from the time of the law. And so what John is saying is, we're in the last hour in this, this continuum of time, and we're now looking forward to the redemption of the church. So that's the context behind what he's trying to tell us. And, you know, don't, don't get all wound up about the fact that dispensationalism as a word is not in the Bible, because neither is the word Trinity. Yet the concept of the Trinity is obviously there. Uh, the word rapture is not in the Bible, yet we see that there is a return of Christ. So this is our construct for trying to understand the scripture. John continues in uh, verse 18 to 23. Children, this is the last hour. Just as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. So there's this distinction between the Antichrist and Antichrists. So John references the Antichrist in both 1 John and 2 John, but he doesn't even talk about it in Revelation. But the, clearly there is a entity, a person, who is the Antichrist that will eventually come at some point in time. But what he's talking about here is that there are many Antichrists that have appeared. So when we look at the Greek word for this, it can either mean against Christ or instead of Christ. And so it would be really inclusive of anything that opposes the work of Jesus and the message of Jesus and salvation or things that are instead of. Consider, for example, counterfeits, you know, replacements, false teachings, false doctrines, you know, any type of religious substitutes. So our, our protection comes from knowing God's word so that we can identify what is counterfeit, what is an antichrist or in the spirit of antichrist. You know, just a, a quick example, 
when uh, the Secret Service is trained on how to identify counterfeit money, for example, they study the original, all of the attributes and characteristics of legitimate money. Because that way when they encounter something that's a counterfeit, they can see, oh, it fails the test. It must be a counterfeit. It makes no sense to try to study the millions of ways counterfeit money can be created. What they do is they focus entirely on what is the original? What are the characteristics of the original? So in the same way, if we're not grounded in God's word, okay, we're going to come back to this. This is a recurring theme. If you're not grounded, you don't have sufficient knowledge and understanding to be able to discern deception. Okay, that ought to be abundantly obvious. Go back to that triangle slide I had in the very beginning, where if you're just coming and taking the milk of the word by going to church and attending a service and that's it, you're not getting into the meat of the word, you're missing out on the learning that's required to discern the difference between something that's deceptive and something that's not. And he goes on, and they went out from us. Okay, super interesting phrase. They went out from us. So obviously these false teachers, these antichrists were among us in the church, but they did not belong to us for they, if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their departure is made it clear that none of them belong to us. So John's making it real clear here that these people that are of the spirit of antichrist, they're teaching a false doctrine or something that's not true about Jesus, they were never believers. You know, they were among us, but they weren't of us. And there, there's no question this is a, a reference to the church because they went out from us, meaning they were already amongst us. Now, I'm not talking here about people who they... They stopped going to church for a while. I mean, you may have had a period of time in your own life where just personal circumstances, difficulties, you're just kind of falling away from the Lord. You just Maybe you were living in sin and it's just uncomfortable to be in church when you're feeling convicted. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why people stay away uh, or they fall away for a period of time, but you know in your heart, no, I should be there. And you come back. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that they leave and they were never among us. They were never believers to begin with. And we know they're in the church. Okay, so this is, this is something that we're facing today in our society. I, I pulled this uh, up from Facebook uh, this week. It was a post from a pastor at a progressive Christian church. It says, the goal is not to bring people to Christianity. The goal is to bring people to love. If that's through Christianity, fine. If it's through another religion or no religion at all, fine. What the world needs is love. Not more people professing right belief. Okay, that is absolutely violently opposed to Scripture. But that is from a pastor of a congregation in Southern California that considers themselves progressive and they're teaching a false gospel, a false doctrine. Okay, so this stuff is everywhere. This is kind of blatant, but there's so many examples under the banner of religion. Okay, this is not a new problem. We're not, we're not supposed to be sitting here thinking, oh, wow, this is something that's, you know, plagued the New Testament church and is still pervasive today. Look at Jeremiah 14, 14. Jeremiah writes, And the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination and deceit in their own minds. So, <laughs> This is an old problem. If this is occurring at the time of Jeremiah, that there were high priests and prophets and people coming in the name of God saying something that's not true. So I'm going to suggest that if it wasn't possible for us as believers to be deceived, this wouldn't be in here. So in some ways, that should terrify you, that you are vulnerable to deception if you're not solidly grounded on God's word. 
that should be a motivation for wanting us to plug in and grow in our faith. Luke 21, verse 8, Jesus replies, Watch out that you're not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. So if Jesus is saying it, it's got to be important. And there's a vulnerability we have as believers in the church unless we're prepared to understand and differentiate deception. So back to John's writing. There's two things that are present in the early church already in Asia Minor that John is speaking to. And it's a set of philosophies that's coming out of a group known as the Gnostics. And they had basically two key uh, reference points. One is that they had special knowledge and you needed to follow their ways to have access to this special information. And the other was that they had a special anointing. They had some kind of special anointing from the Lord that made them the spokesperson of God. John is saying, no, 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 no. Both are false. Continuing on, Chapter 2, verse 18 to 23. You, however, have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I have not written to you because of lack of knowledge of the truth, but because you have it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is a liar, if not the one who denies that Jesus was the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. So this, this idea of if you don't have the anointing, you're going to be lost is, is wrong. John's saying you have the anointing from the Holy One. You are anointed by the Holy Spirit if you're a believer, period, done. But you cannot have godly wisdom or understanding or discernment or spiritual insight unless you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So they have this fundamental belief and understanding. Now, obviously this can't be a reference to all the mysteries of the Bible because it takes us a lifetime to learn and grow in our faith. I think what John's referring to is what is the fundamental nature and message of Jesus Christ? And what is that message of salvation that is important? And he's saying, you know, you have the truth and you have the anointing from the Holy One. Therefore, you have the ability to understand and have this knowledge. Now, this is also in direct opposition to even churches today that say, Come to our church. We have something special that you can't get anywhere else. Our church is anointed. Our church has a certain belief or we practice certain things. And unless you have these things, you're not something. Okay, John's saying no. He's saying because you have the Holy Spirit, you don't need anything else. This is sufficient. In the Gospel of John, Chapter 14, verses 1 through 11, John writes, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me as well. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to place, uh, prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence so that where I am, you will be all saved. And you know the way. You know the place I'm going. So the thing I want to focus in on here is that this reference to, you know the way, you know the place I'm going. Jesus is telling his disciples, look, you already know where I'm going. You, you have this knowledge. It's not rocket science. It's, it's very, very clear that it's a simple idea. Okay, but some of the disciples are not getting it. In, 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 the, in this passage, uh, the Lord says to Thomas, or Thomas says, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answers him back, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, that classic verse is in response to doubting Thomas, not understanding what's going to happen. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So, like, I, I can just imagine this playing out where Thomas is saying, 
uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. What do you mean? What do you mean you, you tell us you know the way and the place I'm going to? Uh, Thomas is saying, no, we don't. And I've got to believe Jesus is thinking like, hello, how many times do I have to say this? I've been with you all this time and you still don't get it. Jesus is saying, I'm the way. You know, there's so many groups out there that will say, well, Jesus was a good person. There's many ways to heaven. Uh, maybe Jesus was a good prophet and worthy of listening to. But you can't have it both ways. Jesus can't be a good person and a good prophet and be lying about who he is in the Father. Either he's a liar or he's telling us the truth that he was sent for the Father and he, the Father is in him. John's not writing to reveal anything special. There's nothing coming out in this passage about a special knowledge, special truth, special insight. He's trying to explain that if you're hearing that, those are voices that can lead you astray. He's saying, look, you already know the truth. And Jesus is even saying this also. I'm the way, the truth, the life, period, done. And there is no other way except through him. Okay, so the story continues. Now, Philip is saying, well, Lord, show us the Father. And that'll be enough. Just show us the Father. You know, and then, you know, I can just hear Jesus saying, you know, hello, are, are you serious? Jesus replies, Philip, I have been with you all this time and still you do not know me? It's like, uh, McFly, hello, how come you don't get it? And I, you know, I, I can just kind of sense some exasperation here in between the lines. Okay, that's not scriptural. That's not part of the text. But it, it just stands to reason because he's, Jesus responds, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father or show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me, performing his works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the account of all the works themselves. Like, hello, look at all the evidence. So again, it goes back to the simplicity of the message of Jesus. And John is making it really, really clear that Jesus had these conversations with his disciples and we can learn from them. So how does John even know it's the last hour? You know, we had some conversation about this. And uh, yeah, I mean, John would know, you would think, because he's walked with Jesus, he's listened to Jesus' teaching. But it's kind of a trick question. And we, we just talked about this because how does John know? Well, this isn't really John's words as much as it is, this is God's word being infused into the gospel writer through the Holy Spirit. So God's telling us that it is the last hour. And we need to read it that way because all scripture is inspired by God. So over and over, he keeps on telling us the same thing. John's reassuring his readers. He's reassuring us that we don't need anything special, that what we have is essential to our salvation and it's enough. And another th question that came up as, as we were talking, how can abiding in Jesus more deeply help us discern antichrists and the spirit of antichrist among us? And w one of the things that, uh, that came up was, you know, it, is like we're learning about the original, that's probably one of the most important things we can do. We can detect counterfeits and discern antichrist when we know the original. But we can't know the original unless we're immersed in learning and understanding God's word. Uh, another thing that came up was uh, resting or abiding in Christ. And, and I, I love that because the, uh, the, the idea there is, uh, what is it? Jesus says, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And so we have this ability to uh, bear fruit because of who we are in Christ. I mean, think, think about it. The branches are connected to the vine. They're not out there on their own <clears throat> trying to produce a fruit. Okay, a branch can't produce... Okay, that was kind of weird. But you get the point. The branch cannot produce a fruit on its own. It's got to be connected to the vine. 
So as long as we're connected to the vine, Jesus Christ, we have the ability to bear fruit and to stand firm and rest and abide in Christ. That, that, that's a whole hour on its own, but it's a wonderful subject. Another question was, how can abiding in Jesus more deeply help us discern? And then what practical steps can we take to abide more deeply? Uh, obviously, knowing our Bible. Uh, we're not going to do a raise of hands. You know, how, many, how many memorized Bible verses? How many of you even know the books of the Bible, uh, can recite them? Or, or how many of you have quiet time on a daily basis? But understand, we have deception coming at us from all directions. I mean, think about it. Government, media, friends, false religions. I mean, there's just stuff everywhere that's bombarding us. I mean, I think this is a very, very serious warning. Because if you don't have the ability to stand strong and discern what is antichrist, against Christ, or a replacement, a, a facsimile, then you're not going to stand firm. And I personally believe that more persecution is coming. And your ability, your personal ability to stand firm is dependent upon how strong you are grounded in God's word. And I hope one day you stand firm. And then how does the anointing of the Holy Spirit help us discern uh, truth from lies? Well, I, I think this is a great opportunity for a, a quick reminder because as we've talked about glorification, sanctification, and justification, we know that uh, we have three parts. Man has a soul, a spirit, and then a soul, which is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And then our, our body, this physical uh, craft that, that we occupy to interact with this world, we have the anointing of the Spirit because we're already sealed. Our spirit is sealed unto the day of redemption. That's our justification in Christ. You've maybe heard, just as if I'd never sinned at all. That's justification. So we stand before a holy God just as if I had never sinned at all because of what Jesus has done for us. So how does the anointing of the Holy Spirit help us discern truth from lies? Well, we have the Spirit inside of us. Inside... We should be cognizant of this all the time when we're asking for discernment or wisdom to discern what's true and what's not true. Okay, let's go on. First uh, John 2, starting in verse 24. As for you, let what you have heard from the beginning remain in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. Okay, so what, what this shows us is that if we remain in him, we have the ability to stay connected to our Father. This means not wavering from the truth. This means uh, absolutely being solid and connected. And this is the promise that he himself made to us, eternal life. In other words, we don't have to worry about it all the way until the day of redemption. This is a very simple message. We see it in Matthew as well. Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened unto you. Okay, there is no magic. There's no uh, list of things you have to do. There is no uh, you know, special formula or things that need to be done in order to achieve uh, this enlightenment. It's just ask. James 1, verse 5 and 6. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. So again, all we have to do is ask. Salvation is simple. John 3.16, we, we know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or one and only son, that anyone that believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In other words, if you believe these things, that Jesus was the Son of God, you're, that's it. If you believe these things, that's all it takes. You don't need to pray three times a day. You don't need to be doing certain rituals. That's not what it says. It is very simple that we have eternal life when we believe in the one and only Son. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him, that's it. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name 
of God's one and only Son. A lot of people might uh, challenge the idea that, uh, well, are, are, are you telling me that I have to believe what you believe in order to go to heaven? Uh, are, are you telling me that uh, if I don't believe what you believe, I'm going to go to hell? Well, not exactly. It's more like we're already born in sin. We're already condemned in the state in which we're born. And that's our default. It's only because we believe in the sacrificial work of Jesus that we have the right to be clothed in Christ's blood and stand before the throne. So, uh, again, it's such a simple message. Okay, in the break, we just uh, discussed a couple of the questions, and that was related to uh, in what way are these passages referring to believers? Well, obviously, like we discussed, the good thing is that we're not saved by works. It's our mind, our will, and our emotions that are still in the process of becoming more Christ-like. So if we had to like rely on good works, uh, it ain't going to happen. We'd be in big trouble. Uh, one of the questions was, how would you summarize the gospel to an unbelieving friend? Uh, I, I like the engineering version. Uh, and that was, quote, compared to Adolf Hitler, I'm a really good guy. Compared to Jesus Christ, I look like Adolf Hitler. So uh, clearly that is a, a, a thing that makes you think. And like you said, it, it makes you really think about what we are in relationship to a perfect standard. Uh, somebody said, it, it's the gospel, it's good news. Uh, absolutely. Uh, somebody else says, uh, it, it was a bridge. It's like a bridge from where we are separated from God to the Father. And then uh, I, I like the other example that was brought up. It's like a survival pack. Uh, it's kind of like an, an easy button, though, because instead of having to hoard all this stuff to survive, all we've got to do is accept Jesus. And it, it reminds me of the passage where uh, Jesus says, my yoke is uh, easy. Uh, the idea there is that, you know, in, in Bible times, they had yoke that would connect two oxen to a plow in order to plow a field. And the, the, the yoke is the, the thing that keeps the oxen on track, on path, so that they're able to successfully reach the end. And Jesus is saying, my yoke, what I'm going to give you and put on you is a light burden that's going to be able to help you succeed and get to the end successfully. So, uh, yeah, all, all these are great ways to, to introduce the concept of, of God's word and the salvation message. Uh, one other question was, what other messages have you heard in the world or in, even in churches that are saying something else? And we had a, a number of, of good examples. Uh, there's all kinds of messaging that is out there that is in addition to God's word or it's supplemental. And it, it's all false doctrine. What kinds of worries, doubts, or fears can those types of teachings cause? Well, I mean, if, if you are doubting your faith, or if you're not rock solid in what you believe, of course you're going to be hearing other ideas and wondering, you know, is that true? How do I know? And so the fact that we're not planted on solid ground as a believer puts us at risk if we're hearing other things and we don't know what's true and what's not true. I, uh, I, I can just uh, recall, you know, this idea of, you know, doubting salvation. You know, when we talked about that, you know, we, we mentioned that, yeah, there's, there's times that, you know, things have come up and, you know, makes us wonder, you know, what's the, the, the truth. But, you know, we always go back to God's word. When I was, uh, when I was three years old, I, I remember my mom was teaching the vacation Bible school. So it was like an after school thing in the afternoons, if I remember right. And there were kids in the neighborhood that would come over. I think it was on Wednesdays. And I remember there was a group in the master bedroom and all these kids were on the master bed. And my mom was using like this flannel graph board. You know, those are the old days. It was like little characters of you know, told the story of Jesus and, you know, his death and his resurrection. She was giving the gospel message to these kids. And she asked them, you know, is there anybody in the group that wanted to accept Jesus? And uh, I raised my hand. I was on the floor next to her as uh, she was talking to the kids. And I, I think she was probably surprised to look down and see, oh, you know, the, the little rug rat down here at her feet uh, raised his hand. And uh, that day I accepted Christ. I remember those things. Uh, but I remember also later when I was five, 
I, uh, I was going to a Christian school and I heard the gospel message again. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to accept Jesus again. I knew I was doing it a second time, but I just figured, you know, I'm so much more intelligent and I understand the gospel and I've matured so much by the time I had gotten to five years old that now I really knew what I was doing. And I, I remember I really thought that. But the thing is, I never, ever, ever doubted again after that that I was saved. No matter what's happened in my life, whether I was off the rails or on track or you know, doing something that I shouldn't be or you know, whatever it is that has happened over the course of a lifetime, I never, ever, ever doubted that I was saved. So that, that's a confidence that we have, not in a feeling, but in God's word. So how can we recognize these teachings when we hear them? We've got to be grounded, absolutely. But last point, uh, we can stand before the throne of God with confidence. Okay, John 2, verse 26 and following. I have written these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. Um, does that mean I don't need to be here? Okay, okay. Someone said yes. Okay, we can talk afterward. Uh, well, what he's saying is, look, we have the Holy Spirit that reveals the mystery of who God is and who Jesus is, and we come to the knowledge of faith because of the movement of the Holy Spirit inside of us. You don't need somebody else to teach you that. You can come to that knowledge just by pre being presented with the gospel. But just as he just as his true and genuine te uh, anointing teaches you about these things, so remain in him as you have been taught. Okay, so we have the ability to know God and not necessarily be dependent upon somebody else when we're presented with the gospel. Uh, understand the significance of this, though. Again, we've got the, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And when we're un unbelievers, like before we accept Jesus, we still have the Holy Spirit working and then we become indwelled with the Holy Spirit and sealed with the Holy Spirit at that point. So, you know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that people run to other people for worldly wisdom when we can seek the Lord for wisdom and guidance because he can teach us all things because we have that spirit within us. He continues, and now little children remain in Christ so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. You know, this, this whole idea of at his coming is uh, very sobering to me. You've probably heard the song, I Can Only Imagine. I uh, played that at my dad's funeral. And so every time I hear it now, it just, it really gets to me. But you know, the song kind of presents this idea of, you know, I don't know if I'm going to dance or if I'm going to sing or, you know, I think some people probably think they're just going to hug Jesus. Well, I cannot imagine anything, right, exactly what you said. I can't imagine anything other than just falling flat on my knees and in tears, just weeping and you know, bowing in worship before a holy God. <laughs> like, I can't imagine anything else. Paul felt unworthy. John the Baptist felt unworthy. I, I, I mean, remember like John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to tie the, the laces of his sandals. I mean, that, that's how I would feel. Uh, and, and I do. I, I just am so appreciative of what God has done for me. But this, there's a, something really strange here. It says that we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. That suggests that it's possible to be ashamed when Jesus comes back, like, what does that mean? Is it really possible as a believer for us to be ashamed when Jesus returns? I, I'm going to suggest that we have scriptural evidence for what it might feel like when Christ shows up and we have nothing to show for our walk with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 through 15 says, Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. Now the day is capitalized because it's in reference to a specific day in the future. There is a day that's coming when this will happen because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each of you have done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, then he'll receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned up, 
he will suffer loss through himself, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So there's works that will be built on the foundation that will survive this test of fire. So God is a consuming fire, right? So what, what, what kind of things can be consumed by fire? Well, it's, it's anything that's done in the flesh that has no eternal value. So when we look at our lives, how we spend our time, where we invest our money, our, our friends, our conversations, what we do with our, our, our time and our energy and our emotions, either it's going to be built on a foundation that survives a test by fire in the day that's coming, or it will be burnt up. So let me give you a visual of what I think might be create a better picture of what this might look like. Imagine somebody who has a fire in their house and all they can do is get out before things start to collapse. What they've done is they've saved themselves and that's it. Everything else burns up. The whole thing burns to ashes down to the foundation. But the foundation is okay. The foundation is there. Nothing else is left because our foundation is in Christ. So the, John's writing seems to suggest, and Paul's writing seems to suggest that it's possible for some people to make it to heaven. Woohoo! Got there! But nothing to show for our time on earth when we had an opportunity to build heavenly treasure. Because the, whatever's built on the foundation of Christ is either going to burn or it's going to stand and survive. I mean, that's another thing that I think should be terrifying. Like, I would not want to get to heaven and realize that everything I did, even things I did for God, was done with the right motive and it burned up. If it was not done with the right motive, it's going to be challenged with fire. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16 says, But God has revealed it to us by the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except for his own spirit within him? Interesting. The spirit within us. So too, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God, who we have inside of us. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. So there's benefits to having the Spirit within us. And this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. This is so interesting because, you know, again, there's false doctrines, false churches, false religions that teach that there's something else that's special that we need in addition to the message of salvation. And that appeals to the flesh, but it does not appeal to the spirit. If we're expected to believe something else, then it's wrong. There are things that, you know, Look at this. This revelation that comes from the Spirit within us is so important, even for understanding the Bible. You know, there's a lot of folks that are going to challenge us and say, well, uh, I don't believe the Bible because I don't believe the story of Noah. Or how did God create the creation when the earth has evidence that it's millions of years old? Or, uh, you know, was there really a flood? You know, was the story of Noah true? I mean, there's all these objections that people come up with. And what I tell people all the time is, look, if somebody doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside of them, they're not going to be able to spiritually discern the mysteries of the Bible and understand God's Word. They need to have the Holy Spirit first and come to the knowledge and saving understanding of who Jesus is first, and then everything else gets revealed. You know, the natural man, in 1 Corinthians 2.10, does not accept the things of the world that come from the Spirit of God. See, the natural man, somebody that does not know Jesus, can't understand this stuff. They're foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because these things are spiritually discerned. Uh, I'll give you another quick story. Uh, it's a great example. Uh, we have... Uh, on, on my ex-wife's side of the family, uh, 
her brother-in-law, my, my kid's uncle, is a Muslim. He's uh, been a Muslim his entire life. His, uh, his entire family is Islamic. And about four weeks ago, okay, like he's an adult guy. I mean, he's got adult kids. He's my age. About four weeks ago, he went to church. I think it was a favor to his wife. And um, the message that was being presented was a gospel message. But from the angle of, look, if you're a father, you have a particularly important role because you're going to be held accountable for whether or not you presented the truth to your children. It's not just about you. And that message really got to him. And like, he just went forward and accepted Christ on the spot. And like the family can't even believe it. Like what just happened to Kevin? And uh, <laughs> my, my daughter Paige was just talking to the family about this because uh, she was in California. And he's brand new in the faith. And he's already said publicly that his goal is to lead all of his family to the Lord. Now, his sister, who's a Muslim, is freaking out. Okay, she's ticked. But the rest of the family is just like blown away at what just happened. And Paige was telling me that Kevin is reading the scripture and he's understanding things from the Bible that people that are believers for 10 years don't even quite understand. And so the family is just amazed at his ability to just go from being an unbeliever to now having Christ inside the Holy Spirit and the ability to discern and having this ability to understand God's word. They are spiritually discerned. Isn't that beautiful? The spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So because we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we have that mind of Christ. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Therefore, let us, I'm sorry, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we profess. This idea of hold firmly is because we have something that's precious. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have the ability to approach God the Father, the creator of the universe, in, in this sinful state because we're redeemed. We can approach the throne of grace so I would just challenge us to hold on to this concept of what we, what we profess, we need to hold on to it. It's precious. So let us hold on to what we know. What we have is so precious, let us learn God's word so that we're not deceived. What we have is so precious, let's share it because there's no greater gift. What we have is so precious, let's work for him for Jesus today while we're on earth so that our works won't be burned up in the day and that we're not ashamed. We, we talked about some, some of the questions here a moment ago. Uh, what is the relationship between the anointing of the Holy Spirit to our ability to understand the mysteries of God? Uh, it's everything. Because we're justified and sealed with the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to understand these mysteries. The natural man cannot, but we can. Why can we approach the throne of a holy God with confidence? Because of what Jesus has done for us. So, when we have felt worried about whether or not we're really, truly saved, um, you know, sometimes that happens. Uh, people doubt their salvation. They have a crisis of faith. And I think the root cause is always lack of understanding of God's word. Because the more you know, the more you are convinced and you're unwavering in your faith. So there is, um, there's a need for us to be assured of our salvation. And as we know from the passage this morning, it doesn't require a, a brilliant teacher. 
You can be in God's word by yourself. I mean, think, think about it. There's churches around the world. There's communities of faith around the world that don't have a pastor. They don't have a building. They don't have structure. They don't have Christmas events. Yet they love the Lord and they learn God's word. I mean, pick your country, Afghanistan, China, North Korea, Iran. These are places where people get like torn out pages of the Bible and they memorize them so that when they go to jail, it's in their mind. Or when it's taken away from them, they have it memorized. You know, sometimes I think that when we look at the faith and the maturity of believers that are in persecuted areas of the world, they put us to shame. They're actually more mature than we are. We need to hold on to our faith and treat it as precious. So what should be our response to the, all of this? What difference can this really make in our lives? And how should it really impact the way we live? I'm gonna answer all those questions and sum up what we talked about. And that is, uh, just going back to what we ended with last week, Jim Elliott's famous quote, the missionary from Ecuador that was killed, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep. There's things that we can do on this world that have no eternal value. If we give those up and we trade them in for things that we cannot lose, things that won't be burned up, but will stand before a holy God, a consuming fire, why wouldn't we give up the things of the world for the things that will stand? That's our challenge. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, what a, a precious, precious letter from the elder John to the churches and to us today. We're part of that extended church that continued to just grow over time. And we take these words seriously because they're so applicable to where we are today. We have false prophets and false teachers and uh, false religions and things on the web and things in, taught in schools all around us bombarding us and our kids, our family. And if we don't stand firm, we're at risk of being deceived. Lord, remind us the, uh, the importance of being in your word and learning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, and what a joy to have as a benefit of living for you that one day when we stand before you face to face, our works will be tested with fire and they'll stand if they're built on the foundation. Lord God, remind us and show us daily, today, tomorrow, when we're at work, tomorrow, when we go out into the mission field that is our, our business environment. Remind us of what we need to do to stand up for our faith and build treasure in heaven. These things I pray in the name of your son, Jesus, amen.